All right, folks. So today, what we're going to be doing is covering some kind of important results and one application coming out of the Bayesian inference, which we introduced last week. And uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of math, enough so that I actually have like a few pages of notes because I uh, actually have to do this math and I don't, I can't remember how to do it all. There's a lot of tedious algebra involved. And so um, we're going to be going through all that. And honestly, I'm going to, I mean, let's be upfront about this. The math is uh, not terribly interesting. <laughs> it's just pretty, pretty tedious. Um, but there's going to be a small moral at the end of each one of the derivations. So uh, grab a cup of coffee or some alcohol and, uh, and then we'll go along with it. Hopefully, I don't know how long this is going to last, probably a good hour and a half, given the, the, cover, the amount of material. But you can, of course, just look underneath and see how long it ended up taking me. Um, also, before I forget, please like and subscribe because, you know, although I technically get a salary to do this, the real thing that keeps me going is your guys' likes and subscriptions. So, first thing that we need to talk about is the central limit theory. Because all throughout uh, the rest of the day, we're going to be using uh, the normal distribution all over the place. And so we might want to ask ourselves, well, what's, why does everyone use the normal distribution? Why is it even called the normal distribution? And the answer is that it's just kind of a weird thing about nature, where if you have a lot of little tiny changes, little tiny random changes, right? So think like a ton of small coin flips, right? Where you get plus one for heads, minus one for tails, and you add up a million of them, right? The distribution ends up being normal. Uh, it's just one of these weird quirks of nature. And so that's the, so that would be the ontological reason. Uh, ontological meaning uh, actual real world reason why we typically often will just assume the normal distribution and want to analyze it. Right, and specifically the central limit theorem actually says that any collection of small changes, when you add them up, you end up getting a normal distribution. Um, now, uh, one thing I should note about that is that uh, if you take the average, for example, so like you have a sample of people and you take their average, um, or, or or a bunch of different uh, you know small changes, and you take the average. That'll also be a normal because you sum them up and you divide by the number of them. You divide by some constant. And so that, because the sum is a normal distribution, when you just scale it down with the uh, divide by n, it's still also normal. If the changes are multiplicative, if you have a bunch of small numbers multiplied by each other, that one won't quite be normal. But if you take the log of it, then the log of a bunch of, of multiplications, products, will turn into uh, just the sum of the log of the, uh, of the values. And so that'll turn into a normal distribution. And so in that case, it's the log of it that will be normally distributed. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and we can actually see this before I actually uh, explain a little bit about the epistemological reason for it. Let's actually take a look at this on the board. I have a nice little program to do this for us. All right, and I'm not even going to bother coding anything today because, frankly, there's so much material with the math that we might as well, just, at least for the programming, let's just have that already be taken care of for us, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I have the central limit theorem show uh, program, which all it does is it samples from some distribution and adds it up, adds up the samples, and then it plots what the distribution of the sum is. All right, so for example, if I have a, nor a uniform distribution to start with, so I, if I just take one sample from it, right, it'll be equally likely between, between anywhere between zero and one, right? And so they're all about equally likely. This is just with, I don't know how many samples I do, let me see. I do a total of 100,000. So 100,000 times I drew one value and then I, I drew the histogram of those 100,000 values. Then what I did was I took, 100,000 samples, and then I put 
But then each time I drew two uniform values rather than just one and I added them together. So what you'll see is it's hard to read that this stupid label here, they now go from zero to two because we are adding two numbers from the uniform. Now, it's pretty rare to get say two zeros in a row or two ones in a row, which the one plus the one will give us the two, zero plus zero is zero. It's more likely that you get some combination that leads close to one half and it's this nice little triangle shape. By the time you get to five distributions, uh, five samples, where you have five numbers, you never really get anything up, you know, up at five over here. I believe this is four and this is two. With five samples, you should average out to be five times one half. So you should get around two and a half. But already you see this and this is starting to look kind of normal, right? And then if you go, uh, once you go with 10 samples, 50 samples, and then 100 samples, the average is 50 as we expect, and this is looking pretty darn normal, right? If you start with a normal distribution instead of a uniform, Right, you add them up and it just stays normal. <laughs> or, you know, the, the, the range of it grows because we're adding them up, but the actual shape just stays normal. And now let's throw it something that's really difficult. We're gonna hand it a U distribution, a U shape. So here it is, I just made this up. You said it's just a quadratic kind of, right? In the likelihood. And so with one value, you know, it's, it's gonna be usually towards one of the extremes of minus one or one. With two of them, you get usually something that's uh, right in the middle here because you typically get one from each on average, right? Because there's two ways to do that. You kind of get a low and then a high or a high and a low versus with this one, you have to get in this section, you have to get two lows and this section, you got to get two highs. Still doesn't look that normal. There are two samples after five. You're starting to get a little bit worried if you don't believe in the central limit there because you can start seeing the shape. You can start seeing this normal curve there. Now it's still quite a ways away. There's still a lot of deviation from it. Time you get to 10, oh no, the waviness is going down. And by the time you get to 50, that thing is normal, right? And by 100, it's definitely normal. And so what you see is that you can try to play around with this, try out different distributions. It'll end up being normal. What's even more impressive is that you can do something like you can take a sample from here, a sample from the uniform. You can actually play around and grab a whole bunch of different uh, samples from a bunch of different distributions. And as long as they all have about the same variance for the different distributions, when you add them all up, it'll still be normal, even if you're drawing from different distributions each time. It's actually really crazy to watch that one. I've done that before. Typically, what you use to do that is you take a beta distribution, because a beta distribution lets you take any stuff between zero and one. Uh, it's like any arbitrary shape between zero and one, more or less, is what you can get. Uh, and so that's a common one to do, and you just vary the parameters on that one randomly. So that way you sometimes get like super extreme ones going in one direction or the other. So I mean, it looks kind of normal or maybe a U-shape type thing. Uh, there's a lot of different shapes you can get from it. Then you just add those up, and you'll see you still end up with a normal, even if you're grabbing different ones each time. So it's really cool. Now, it doesn't work, I should say. Uh, in a few situations. One is that if you take a bunch of small numbers, like between zero and one, and then you suddenly take one large shift or something, because that large shift will obviously dominate the rest and it'll, and it'll dictate the shape of it a lot. Also, uh, there's certain ones where there's certain distributions like the Cauchy distribution, where it doesn't actually have a finite mean or variance, and that those can cause problems. If you keep sampling from a Cauchy and add them up, you actually still end up with, I believe, a Cauchy. Uh, I should double check on that one, but you know, anyway doesn't really matter. It doesn't converge to the normal is the point. All right, so we got that. That's kind of cool, right? Now, uh, so, so as a quick example here, if you look at the um, distribution of, say, heights in the United States of people, do you think that's normal? Well, uh, of course, people's heights, when you think about it, it's a, it's a, there's a ton of factors in it, right? There's a bunch of small genetic factors in each little you know, imagine each gene you flip maybe adds a little tiny bit or subtracts a little bit from your height. Uh, you also have things like uh, your nutrition and stuff. So there's a lot of variance that, you know, your nutrition is lots of little tiny things added up over the course of your life or over the course of at least your childhood. And so, you know, you, you would expect that a lot of small changes would make it normal. Uh, it is not, all right? First of all, if you try to draw the distribution of height of people in the US, it looks something along the lines of, uh, let's see here, probably, I'm making it up, but you know, this should give you a good idea of it. Uh, maybe, maybe not that small. 
maybe it goes like this. But after a certain point, it's not like anybody's height is like under, you know, like, like this, right? There's nobody who's like this tall, really, right? And then it goes up though, and then uh, then it kind of carries, and then it goes down. Well, it's maybe something like this. Now, what happens is the reason for this, why this is uh, kind of oddly shaped, and actually I didn't quite draw this the way I wanted to. Let me actually draw it a little bit more carefully, right? It probably looks something more like this, where you can see that it's definitely skewed, where there's a lot of pretty short people compared to the height, the higher, taller people, right? Now, why do we have this weird thing where there's a lot of short people? Well, we call them children, right? Children tend to be shorter, right? So you go, oh, okay, okay, wait, wait, yeah. What if we're only talking about adults, right? If we just filter out the children, because they're still growing, right? We're talking about final height here. So we get rid of the kids, right? And now if we get rid of all the kids, the distribution, is it normal now? Ooh, still not. What it will look like is something that looks something along these lines. It has a little bit of a flatter peak there. Why is that? Well, because I warned you, you know, there's this normal distribution of your heights, except that there's one thing that has a big effect on your height, and that is, are you male or female, right? Men tend to be taller than women, right? So you actually have something like two normal distributions, right, overlapped with one another. And you know, it gives you this kind of like flat flattening over here, right? Now. The distribution of men's heights in the US, adult men, that's approximately normal. It is. And same thing with adult women. It's approximately normal. There might be a little bit on the edge where maybe it's a little bit fatter tails or something. But in general, uh, they're approximately normal, as you'd expect. But you just got to be careful because lots of times you might sit there and think, oh, yeah, well, you know, lots of small changes has to be normal. But uh, no, there's lots of times in reality, in reality where there are single changes that have a big effect, for example, or things like that, which makes it so that way things aren't normally distributed. <laughs> and you gotta be careful about it. But you can oftentimes find some sort of subset of the data that will be, or maybe the error from predictions, right? So if you factor an age or something into a regression, maybe then the error from it will be normal or things like that, right? Because your error is caused by a lot of small, varying small effects of things that you didn't account for. So anyway, so you have this, so why, so would we maybe use still a normal distribution to describe this when we're modeling? Yeah, you still can. And the reason why is because in this case, it would look something like if you tried to fit a normal distribution to it, it might look something like this. You know, I don't know exactly. That doesn't look very normal, does it? Oh, well, whatever. I can't draw a normal distribution that well. Uh, but the, there, there's a theory, the epistemological reason for using normal distributions, and I'm going to move on from this pretty quickly here because you don't have really time for it. There's a, there's a lot of theory that talks about how normal distributions are a maximum entropy distribution. And specifically, uh, if you know, if all that you know about the distribution or all that you care about the distribution is the mean and the standard deviation, then it turns out that kind of the the simplest and most general uh, distribution you can use is a normal distribution, right? The one that assumes the least, right? Because if you just have the mean and standard deviation, that's a normal distribution. So if you don't care about the other stuff, you can approximate everything using a normal distribution. And it's generally considered a very conservative distribution to use. And so there's actually some other theoretical philosoph philosophical reasons for using a normal distribution when you're describing stuff. But I'm not going to get into it too much in this class, all right? I'm just doing this for the motivation for why it is that for the next three derivations, we're using the normal distribution everywhere, all right? So, all right, so. That's why we use the normal distribution. Now let's actually use it. You can see I just did a nice little jump cut here because I screwed up on some of my derivation. I want to take a break and get some water. And so uh, now I uh, now let's go back and actually solve a problem using that. So based on everything we learned last time, let's suppose that you're driving down your car, driving down in your car, and 
you have your phone on you. And being, you know, a good American citizen, you have your location tracking on. And so your phone is tracking where your location is sending it off to who knows who, right? At least to Google, right? At least my phone does. So how does it know where you are? Well, it uses two pieces of information. At least I'm pretty sure it does. I'm kind of making this up. But I mean, this is approximately how I know that these things typically work. Uh, the first way it does is via GPS, right? So what happens is every now and then it pings the GPS satellite, triangulates your location or whatnot via the uh, via the um, the cell towers or whatnot, and it gets you a good estimate, right? And it says, all right, here's here's your location. Now it doesn't know it exactly, right? And because there's a lot of little tiny errors that can add on to it. Uh, it's usually a normal distribution, but it gives you your location of Y, and it has some standard deviation of, of sigma, we'll say, okay? So you get this now and then. It doesn't ping it, you know, continually, like every every like tenth of a second or 20 times a second, because that will just drain your battery, I'm sure. So it probably only does it every now and then. So what does it do in the meantime? In between pings of the GPS, how does it know where you are? What it does is it would probably use the accelerometer on your phone. And what the accelerometer does is whenever it feels a force or an acceleration in any direction, it records that acceleration. And by integrating that, uh, it'll get what your speed is. It can estimate what your speed is because it feels, oh, you speeding up? All right, then there's the velocity, right? Because it also knows your direction. And then if you integrate that again, then it can say, okay, given your velocity, now it can figure out how fast your speed is, uh, your position is changing. But these things, because you have these integrated errors and stuff, it can really lead to some bad estimates. So what can happen to it is that maybe it says, all right, I'm really not sure, right? But I think you're right here, all right? Oh boy, that is totally asymmetric. I should not have done that that way. All right, there we go. Right, and so here's my best guess for where you are. And we're gonna be labeling this mu naught. And then it has some standard deviation, which in this case is much larger, and that we're gonna call tau. Uh, we'll call it tau naught, actually. All right. Now, what we wanna know is given these two pieces of information, what's our best guess to your actual location? Fair question. All right, and so what we need to know is one, you know, what's our best guess, but also just in general, what's the distribution for it, right? I don't know what it's gonna look like. Well, I do, but you know, I don't wanna give it away, right? So, you know, it's gonna have some sort of shape to it. I'm just gonna draw a normal here. Maybe it'll look something like this. I'm kind of making it up, right? And we're gonna label this one. Uh, it might be normal, it might not be, right? And then we kind of want to know this location, all right? Which is theta. What's the distribution for theta, which is where you're going to be, right? It could be all wiggly waggly. Maybe it's like this, right? I don't know what it looks like, right? But there's going to be some distribution for where we actually think you are. Maybe it's some mixture of the two. Who knows, right? And so we need to figure out what the equation is for this theta based on our data here, right? These two pieces of information. So it's kind of arbitrary which one of these two informations you kind of call your prior and which one you call your data. But you can imagine that your phone is always keeping track of this one. So it's sitting there going, okay, well, this is where I currently think you are based on the accelerometry data. And then in comes the data from the GPS. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label this one kind of our prior, and this one is going to be our data. All right, so what we want to know is what is the probability of our theta given our data that we got, right? And we know from Bayes' rule and from the last class that this is just equal to the probability of the data given our theta times our prior for our theta divided by the probability of the data. Now, I also have told you, and I'll switch back to a better pen here, that this down here is typically just a normalization factor. This makes it that way, this whole thing sums up to one in the case of a 
uh, of a discrete distribution, or in the case of a continuous distribution like this, it'll make sure that it integrates to one, right? So what we're gonna do, and we're gonna do this uh, pretty much every single time today, I think all three times we're gonna do this, for th or three of our four derivations we're gonna do this on, we're gonna change this to a proportional to, and then what we'll say is at the end, if we will, really wanna actually make this equal, we'll just integrate this thing up and then divide out you know, whatever it sums to. So if it integrates to like five, then we add a one fifth in front and then that way it'll be normalized, right? So we just normalize it after to make it actually be equal to. And by doing this, it's going to one, get rid of all the stuff on the bottom that we would have had to deal with. But also there's a lot of times that constants are gonna pop out of here and like scaling factors and we can just dump them. Just like how in the, uh, for the binomial, we had the binomial coefficient come in and we just say, oh, I'll get rid of that. Or the prior, which was like one fifth, and we just say, ah, oh, get rid of all those one fifths. At the end, we'll normalize. All right. So that's what we're going to be doing here. Now, both of our prior and the likelihood of the data, as we'll see, are both normal distributions here. And so because of that, uh, what we need is first of all, we need the PDF of a normal distribution. The distribution, all right. And hopefully you guys know this, but if not, I'm going to write it right here. F of X is equal to one over Sigma two root two pi E to the minus one over two Sigma squared. And then you have X minus mu squared. All right. So first things first. All right. Given that we assume that the GPS here is the data that comes in from the GPS is normally distributed about our true value, right? So we have some true value, right? The GPS has some accuracy. You know, oftentimes you see a little uh, circle around your current location. They know, oh, yeah, you know, we aren't quite sure within this region. The reason why is that in general, the GPS says, okay, I can get your location within 10 meters, right? And on average, I'll be right, right? I'll be dead on. But, you know, there's some variance on it, which I labeled sigma here, some error in it. And so because of that, that error, you know, the, the actual true data point is going to be within sigma of the true value. All right. So what we have to say is that suppose I told you the true value was over here, right? Or, well, okay, well, this date, the point from the... Uh, from the GPS would be very unlikely because it's supposed to have a pretty low error and it would be way off from what you would expect, right? But meanwhile, if the true, uh, if the true theta was over here, so it's like, ah, oh, yeah, it was off by quite a bit, but not horrific. You know, it was pretty bad. It was pretty darn bad. But you know, if the true theta is over here, we expect it well is in that range, right? So let's write down the equation for this. So it's going to be one over sigma root two pi. I'll put a parenthesis around it just to show that this is just the likelihood portion. E to the minus one over two sigma squared. And then our true value, you know, what we saw was y versus the true value of theta, right? So this is how likely would we have gotten this y given our theta and our general variance or standard deviation of the accuracy in the GPS, all right? I, by the way, I know I've drawn this where it's like, all right, the GPS in reality, the way you can think about it is, you know, this is our theta, our true value, which we don't know. And then we expect the GPS is Y to be distributed around it, right? With sigma. That's what we're really saying here is that our Y is distributed normally around theta with sigma squared standard deviation. And then we also know that our theta is distributed normally about our mean mu naught and tau naught squared. And what this is saying is that our prior belief on our theta is that it's normally distributed about uh, mu naught with tau naught squared being our uncertainty in our prior, right, before we got the GPS data. And then we expect the GPS data, y, to be normally distributed about this right, about our true value with sigma squared. That's really how you're gonna draw it. 
but we were actually but when your phone sees it they see it as instead here's our y uh, value and we have this error right sigma and so it's kind of, it, what we'll see is that it's actually just doing kind of an inverse here and it's actually perfectly equivalent and that's because you can imagine right here if you swapped y and theta here when you square it it doesn't matter right because you can see like two minus one is one one square is one but one minus two is negative one but because you square the negative always goes away so it actually doesn't matter which order you do with this and you can swap the two right and so it's kind of equivalent either way which way you view it normally distributed about theta is where a y is or uh, normally distributed about the y is where the theta would be all right so anyway Back to the matter at hand, we've written out our likelihood, the probability that we would have gotten this GPS data Y given our theta. And this is, by the way, a common way of writing kind of our model here. And then we have our prior here, which is that before we saw this GPS data, what did we think the distribution of theta was? This right here, right? And so what we thought it was, was one over tau naught two pi, e to the minus one over two tau naught squared uh, theta minus mu naught squared, right? And this is just saying that if our theta turns out to be way over here, we wouldn't expect that to be very likely given our prior belief said that it thought it was gonna be in this region over here, although it wasn't too certain, all right? Wow, that really got up pretty tall there. But this right here, is our distribution, all right? This is our posterior, right? Our posterior, our belief on theta should be proportional to this thing, right? So we just gotta multiply these two normal distributions together. All right, well, first thing that we can do, thank goodness, this is just a number, right? This is our precision for our, you know, the standard deviation of our GPS. This right here is kind of like the standard deviation from our accelerometer. Two pi is just a constant, right? So all this stuff out front is just a constant that's gonna be scaling this thing up or down, our thetas, right? Because it's gonna be the same, no matter what theta we're looking at here, whatever value for theta, this stuff is just a constant. And so because we have this proportional to, we can already just get rid of this stuff, right? This stuff, just part of the normalization, eat that in the normalization. So now what we have is that we have just e to this power times e to this power, and we multiply the, the two powers, we just add them, right? We add the exponents. So this is going to be proportional to e to the minus one half. And then now I'm going to pull out the one half here and we get y minus theta squared all over sigma squared. And then the one half comes out of here too, uh, the minus one half. And then we get let me just erase a bit of this, that way it's clear here, plus theta minus mu naught squared all over tau naught squared. All right. So this is quite a bit here. But this is what we have so far. Now let's try to work on simplifying this. All right. Because this is our distribution for what we think data could be. All right, so let's try to simplify this sum. It turns out the only way to simplify it is by expanding it, which is gonna be a big mess, all right? But we're gonna do it. And then we'll do a couple nice little substitutions. And you're gonna look at it and you're gonna say these equations are horrific still. But then stop, we'll take a step back, we'll think about it and I think it'll make sense. All right. By the way, if you haven't already, make sure that you, uh, you're you drinking your, your coffee or your beer by now. Because trust me, this is actually not the worst derivation. The second one's going to be the worst, all right? So we have this. And we have e to the minus one half. And, and then we have this thing. So let's expand these out. Oh, boy. That should be fun. All right. Let's do this. All right. Uh, maybe I'll put a little bracket. All right, so first we get the y squared over sigma squared. We get the minus 2 theta y 
2 theta y over sigma squared. And we get the plus theta squared over sigma squared. I'm putting everything over sigma squared. You'll see why in a moment, because we're going to have to uh, put these things together in just a moment. And over here, now we have plus theta squared over tau naught squared plus 2 mu naught theta over tau naught squared plus, um, let's see here, mu naught squared over tau naught squared. All right. Easy enough. This is already looking cleaner, right? Looks way better. All right. Now we got to group like terms by the variable we're interested in, which is theta. Remember, that's what we're interested in is theta. Just to remind you, this is probability of theta given our data, right? Given our y here. Well, alternatively, if you want, you can say this is given y, right? Which is the only thing we really got from the GPS is here's my guess. That's where you are. So this guy right here is equal to e, and oops, this thing has to be a proportional to, not equal to, right? So now we get a minus one half. Now let's group these like terms together. We got a one over sigma squared plus one over tau naught squared times theta squared, right? So that takes care of those two terms. Now we got our thetas here, which is, oh, this should be a minus. Ooh, just made a mistake there. Now I'm bound to make a couple mistakes during this, right? So if you catch a mistake, obviously you can't yell at me. This is a YouTube recording. That would be dumb of you. Um, not as dumb as me for making the mistake. But anyway, uh, you can just tell me about it later or I'll catch it later. Eventually I'll get the wrong answer and I'll be like, uh-oh. All right. So now here, now we take minus and then we have 2y plus um, y plus... Uh, well, okay, sorry. 2y uh, y over sigma squared plus mu naught over tau naught squared times theta. I believe that's what these two terms give us. All right, I pulled out the minus 2 out in front, and then you're left with, and then I pulled the theta out afterwards. So now you're left with y over sigma squared, mu naught over tau naught squared. And then finally, you have plus this y squared over theta over sigma squared plus mu naught squared over tau naught squared. All right. Cool. All right. Nice. Okay. Let's make our first actual simplifying assumption here. All right. Do the first time we're actually going to make things a little bit simpler. And what we're going to say is that in general, uh, there's two ways to write this. Either tau 1 squared is equal to 1 over sigma squared. Uh, uh, i got to write this a little bit differently. 1 over 1 over sigma squared plus 1 over tau naught squared. I know that looks like a weird one. That looks like a weird substitution that we want to do because we don't see this anywhere over here. I got gotcha. you. I, I agree. But bear with me here. And then because of this, if we take one over this, what we see is one over tau naught squared is equal to the reciprocal of this, which is just one over sigma squared plus one over tau naught squared. All right. So this is the first kind of important substitution that we're going to be making here. So here, this one right here is just going to be 1 over tau 1 squared, right? Okay. And then we're going to pull that out. So that'll be fun. All right, let's see here. I just want to make sure that this makes sense here. Yep. So real fast here, this thing right here is going to be 1 over tau not squared. Uh, tau 1 squared. And now if we pull out that, right, or alternatively, what you can think of it is that we're going to multiply this whole thing by tau 1 squared over tau 1 squared. 
and we're going to actually push in the tau one squared to cancel out here. So what that's going to give us is minus one over two tau one. I almost did that pi tau one squared. You might have to pause it and think about this one for one second. So now we're pulling in a tau one squared, and that one cancels out. Now we just have theta squared minus two tau one squared y over sigma squared plus mu naught over tau one naught squared theta plus tau one squared y squared over sigma squared plus mu naught squared over tau naught squared. Now I just want to point out one thing here. All right. We already know the variances of these two things. These are just measured values. And so this thing is still also just a constant. It doesn't involve theta at all. And one way to interpret this, I'll just say right now, just so that way you keep it in mind here, right? If the variance is sigma squared, then one over the variance is what we call the precision. And in this case, since the higher the variance, the worse, but since it's the reciprocal, uh, the, the higher the precision is, that is how tight you are, right? So therefore, pretty much when this gets smaller, or variance, the precision, one over it, goes up. So if you have very high precision, that means that your distribution is really tight, all right? And then the way to view this is that this value right here is some precision value, which is the sum of the two precisions of our prior and our data, right? Our GPS and our accelerometer, you add their precisions together and it gives us this, tau, this one over tau one squared, which we'll talk about in more in just a minute, all right? So we got this, this is cool. Still not that simple, but now I'm gonna actually do a little trick here. Oh, I forgot, I forgot my E. The E is critical here, all right? So now we actually got, get a nice little uh, trick here, all right? This one you're gonna like, I promise, right? So this one involves theta, this term right here involves theta, but this term does not involve a theta, right? So technically what I can do is I can say, you know, this is of course just a, um, a an, uh, an exponent to this E, right? I can break this up a little bit, right? I'll, I'll factor this one back and I'll break these two off. And what you're gonna get is that this should equal E to the minus one, two over tau one squared, right? And then we still have this part right here, theta squared minus two tau one squared um, y over sigma squared plus mu naught over tau naught squared um, theta. Yeah, it's all kind of tedious, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and then this whole thing right here, Right, which once again, I'll have to factor this in so it's just a, uh, it's like this, it'll look like minus one half, and you have the, this thing cancel out back, you know, because we actually had added it in and we're just taking it back out. Y squared over sigma squared plus mu naught squared over tau naught squared, right? Whatever, this whole junk. What, what actually happens at the end of the day is that we have this thing minus this thing, right? But we can actually take it back and say, okay, easy enough, right? It's this thing times e to this power, right? We can technically say it's this whole e term, take it back to times e to this power. And this thing right here, it's the y, it's the sigma, it's the mu naught, it's the tau naught. These are all just numbers. These are all just measurements, right? So this whole thing turns out to just be a scalar term that is uh, going to be, um, that just modulates everything. And we're going to take care of that at the end just by taking our uh, normalization. So we just dump this whole term. This whole term goes away just like all the other constants did. This is just another complicated constant. So it just goes away. We'll put it into the memory hole. Banish it. It's gone. Nice. So now we're down to here. All right. Now, then, this one, maybe instead of writing it out like this, yeah, I shouldn't have done the substitution already. Doesn't really matter here. Tau one squared looks like this, right? So let's actually quickly rewrite this. 
where tau one squared is going on the bottom here, where it's going to be two, and then we have the division here, right? Because one over this thing is going to be one over sigma squared plus one over tau naught squared, right? This is actually worthwhile doing, I promise. All right. So we have this, and right now I'm going to quickly substitute this thing by calling this a variable, which I'm going to call mu1. Mu1 I'm going to define as this weird thing, right? Which is going to be y, and actually I'm going to write it a little bit differently, just a smidge, not much, don't worry. 1 over sigma squared y, I'm just moving the y in front, that's all, or in back there, plus 1 over tau naught squared mu naught divided by 1 over sigma squared plus 1 over tau naught squared. This looks like kind of a, an interesting formula, but we'll see in a moment what it actually has to do with anything. All right, so these are the two formulas we're going to have to remember at the end of the day. We'll see, it'll all make sense, I promise. So this, to simplify it, looks like e to the minus 1 over 2 tau 1 squared times just theta squared minus 2 mu 1 theta. All right. By the way, once again, this one doesn't involve theta at all. These are all just constants. This is just a number that we calculate from measurements, just like this one. So we have this guy. And this looks very close to a perfect square. All we have to do is add on what we have to add mu 1 squared. Uh, and then minus mu1 squared, right? Because obviously we can't just add it out of the blue, right? And if we have this guy, then this term right here looks like a nice little perfect square, right? So what we end up with will be this thing is equal to e to the minus 1 over 2 tau 1 squared. And then this perfect square right here gives us theta minus mu1 squared, or else. Uh, yeah, that's fine right there. And then we have minus mu1 squared, right? Let me factor this the guy back in here, right? So what it ends up giving us is uh, do, 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 plus one half uh, plus, sorry, plus one over two tau one squared. Uh, mu1, right? It looks something like that, right? Once we've done it, and then we can get rid of this guy right here, right? So there's, wow, that's a pretty bad two right there. Let me fix that. Two, let me rewrite that whole part. Two tau one squared. All right, cool. Now, then, once again, I said that these are all just measurements, right? No theta in that at all. And so we do the same trick. We got the e right here. We can say e to this power times e to this power. And that whole thing is a constant, goes down the memory hole, it's gone. And so this is what we get. All right. So last, so finally now we're all done. I promise this is actually it now, right? So therefore p of theta, given our y data, should be proportional to e to the minus 1 over 2 tau 1 squared times theta minus mu 1 squared. Now, what is this formula? The right-hand side here is just an unnormalized normal distribution, right? With variance equal to tau 1 squared and mean of mu 1. So what this tells us is that with our data here, right, where we had our original uh, estimate from our accelerometer, and then we get our data point from the uh, GPS, that our posterior is a normal distribution. So it's not all wiggly at all. It's just another normal distribution. And it has mean mu1 and standard deviation of tau1. All right. So now let's just quickly describe what this will actually look like. It actually looks something along those lines. Now, let's interpret these terms right here, because now that we know what it is, 
now we actually care. What is tau one here? What, how do we actually interpret it in terms of sigma and you know in terms of our previous variances between our two data points? And how on earth do we interpret this thing of mu one? It turns out they have very natural, intuitive explanations and understandings. All right, and it will all make sense. So by the way, if you want to do the normalization here, just real fast, that's just going to be because we know the equation of a normal distribution. That's just going to be tau one root two pi. So if we did all those constants that we got rid of, right? It turns out once we integrate everything here, they all would have canceled, and you would have just ended up with this term tau one uh, two root two pi. So anyway, now let's look at this really fast, just so that way we can understand what this tau one and mu one are, and then we'll move on. And then I'll actually explain what the lesson is from doing all this, all right? Why do we bother doing all this derivation? Great question. It actually won't be completely clear for another few weeks, but I promise we're gonna bring this up again and be like, aha. So make sure you write these down and remember. Commit them to memory or something. So what happens is that I was telling you that you can interpret these as precisions, right? This is how precise this estimate is. This is how precise this one is. And the higher the precision, the more tight the distribution, right? The better the estimate. And what happens is that this says that our the precision of our uh, final distribution is equal to the precision, the sum of their precision. So we add precisions. So what that tells you immediately is that if you have a data point, and then you add in another normal distribution, some more data, even if it has low precision, right? The posterior will always have a tighter distribution than either of the other two data points, right? Because we're combining two data points. When you add more data, you get more precise estimate. It doesn't somehow just because this one's strong and then this one's weak, suddenly make the posterior weak and wide. If necessary, worst case scenario, this thing is like, super wide and it just ignores it right it just says, oh this data is so inaccurate i'm just going to keep this one and you have the same precision if this thing goes off to if this accelerometry data goes off towards infinity with its variance because it's so uncertain then the posterior is just going to ignore it and stay with this one right if the standard deviation here goes off to infinity this term just as one over infinity goes off to zero and you just say your your posterior is the exact same as your prior I mean, exact same as your data because the prior has an infinite uh, variance. Similarly, we might get some intuition if we set this tau naught to infinity, we see this term goes to zero and so does this term. And now you're just left with one over sigma squared y over one over sigma squared. That stuff goes away and you just have mu one equals y. So you can see right here that if our acceler accelerometer data is super, super imprecise relative to the GPS, it just ignores the accelerometry data and will give you the posterior is just equal to the original distribution that we had from the data, right? Estimate is Y centered on Y and precision is the same as the original GPS data. So worst case scenario, we do that. But, and similarly, we can do the opposite where if the GPS was super imprecise, say we just didn't get it, then it just reverts back to using the accelerometry data. Now, what if it's somewhere in between like this one? All right, well, like I said, first of all, it adds the precision, so it's gonna get more precise. And what is this mu one, right? So the question is where is, this, where is this new normal distribution centered on? The way to interpret this, you should have seen something along these lines once before. Let me write it out a little bit differently and maybe this will make a little bit more sense, this formula. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split the numerator into two parts, right? So we have one over sigma squared, which remember just the precision, over one over sigma squared plus one over tau naught squared times y plus one over tau naught squared over one over sigma squared plus one over tau naught squared and then mu naught. All right, hopefully you will recognize this. This is a weighted average, right? Because the denominator is the same, All right? And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna be 
you're going to take y, right? You're going to be y, you're going to take that when you weight it by its precision for the estimate there. And then you take the, and then you weight the estimate for mu naught by its precision, right? And therefore, the one that's more precise, the one with the lower variance, this, the denominator is smaller, so therefore the, ver the precision is higher, you're going to have your estimate be closer to that value. All right, if you're having problems understanding this, think about it like this. If I say that 0.5y plus 0.5x, that would be halfway between, or uh, let me do x1 and x2, for example, x1, x2. If I say this, you already know this is the average between the two of them, right? You just take the average, right? You're going to pick halfway between x1 and x2. If I say 0.25x1 plus 0.75x2, that means I'm 75% of the way to x2. And, you know, I use 25% of x1, but I'm more towards, I'm weighting x2 more for this sum. Same thing here. We have our y, we have our mu naught, and we weight them. This is making sure that the sum of these two weights here is one, because if you take this plus this, you get one in front. So that's why you know that this is just like this, where it sums up to one. And it's just a matter of how strongly you're going to weight mu naught versus y. All right. And the more precise the estimate, the more you weight it. So what's going to happen here is because this one is less precise, our mean for our theta is going to be closer towards the GPS data than it is the uh, the accelerometry data. So and that does it for number one here. Now, why did I do this, all this math? One is just to get you a feel for how if you actually wanted to do the math of this Bayesian stuff, it's not trivial, but it will always solve it. It will solve it if you do it. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes the math is actually intractable. Now, this was just algebra, but in the next problem, you'll see how if we actually try to do it, it will actually fail. Like you actually, uh, like you can do it, but sometimes if you're in more complicated problems, it'll just fail and you can't actually do it analytically. All right. And I'll show you that next problem. But the thing, but the big takeaway here, I'm going to write the takeaway up at the top here. The reason why we did this derivation is one, just to get you a little bit of practice with math. But importantly, this is going to come up again in another week or two when we talk about Kalman filters or Kalman filters. I don't know what, how it's pronounced. I think it depends on where you're from. All right. So the Kalman filter is used everywhere in exactly that type of situation I was talking about for combining data that is imprecise. And it's used all over in engineering and even in economics, it's used in a lot of models, all right? And it's specifically called, it's a very simple hidden Markov model. So yeah, we're gonna make it back to Markov chains and stuff. And, uh, and when we do that, when we combine this uncertainty in these two estimates, for example, uh, with a hidden Markov model, we're gonna get what's called the Kalman filter. And all it is, is just taking normal data and combining them repeatedly. You keep combining more and more uh, normal data, and then you start trying to figure out some uh, some estimates to actually where you are and things like that. All right. This is exactly kind of the example I gave. I pretty much gave all but one step of a Kalman filter, one or two steps. All right. This whole thing just pretty much solved that. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to get the payoff when we do that. Now on to derivation number two. Now this one's where I really need the paper for. So here we go. Let's suppose that we wanted to figure out, you know, this is the problem, the motivating example I used last week, which was we want to know the average height of a male student on Chapman. And we said, okay, suppose we grab some people at random, measure their heights. And now what we want to know is what is the distribution of uh, our estimate for their heights, right? We want to know what's the probability that they're above six feet on average, right? Well, it turns out that there's two things we don't know. What we know is that the actual data, right, so the heights from each person, yi, should be distributed normally about some mean, which is the mean height of the population, and some standard deviation, right? And we don't know either of these. We actually don't know either of these values. We don't know are people's heights very close together at Chapman, or are there or is there a wide variance? We don't know, right? And we also don't know what the average is. 
So it could look like this, where it's tight around some value, let's say six foot one. Yeah, right. Or it could be that it's centered like this and spread out. And the actual is five foot eight or something like that, or five foot 10. Right? We don't know if it's spread out a lot with some wide sigma or with a small sigma, and we don't know where it's centered either. We don't know anything about this darn distribution. All right? Now, for the sake of this math, just because it makes things a little bit easier on my end, instead of using theta squared, you know, I mean, I mean sigma for the standard deviation, I'm just going to use phi, which means the variance, all right? So I'm just going to use phi as the variance, right? Phi is equal to sigma squared. It is going to make my life a lot easier. I don't have to write the squared everywhere, all right? And also later on, we're eventually going to go into that space anyway. So what we're going to do is we have some data. We got a bunch of, we have n data points, and we want to be able to figure this out. n data points, measured heights. And we want to figure out what is the distribution of now we have two things we don't know, so we got to get the mu and the phi given our data, right? Which I'll say we have a vector of 30 data, of n data points, right? So this is what we want to get. Oh boy. Okay. Well, this is going to be proportional to just the likelihood of having gotten the data given our mu and our phi times our prior on the mu and the phi, and it's proportional to, so I'm not even going to divide by the post, uh, the prior predictive there, right? The probability of data. I'm just going to, the probability of our y's. So we got to get this. So one thing we're going to need to do is get our prior here, and the other thing we're going to need to do is get the likelihood. Now, each one of these heights, we presume are independent. All right, that's an assumption we make. It's actually not necessarily a guaranteed assumption here, right? Because what happens if we end up sampling people who are brother, like siblings, right? If I know one of their heights, I can actually predict something about their other height, right? So they actually aren't independent in that case, right? Why brother one, you know, probability of why brother one comma why brother two splits up into probability of why brother one given y brother 2 times probability of y brother 2. So this might be a normal distribution. And of course, all this is conditional on mu and sigma here. But if I know brother 1's height, I might be able to say something about uh, brother 2's height. We might be able to know something about uh, um, y brother 1, right? About the height of the first brother. So technically, there could be reasons why you actually don't think these are truly independent because here we can't just get rid of this, right? Knowing this actually does help us, but we're going to ignore all that. We'll assume that they are actually independent. Thank goodness. And if they are, then the probability of Y here turns into the probability, uh, the product of the probability of Y, at least they're conditionally independent, I should say probability of yi given mu and phi, right? And this one is i equals one to n, right? So we have to do the product, right? Just like how, you know, that's the summation, this is the product. So this, so p of y1 mu sigma times probability p of y2 times p of y3 times p of y4 and so forth. We have to product all those together because they're independent. And then we still have this, uh, the prior here, which is P of mu and five, which I'll deal with shortly, all right? It's nothing too bad. We're gonna assume for our case here, we're gonna choose a very, very conservative prior, a non-informative prior. And we're gonna do this because it's gonna help inform us some pretty interesting, we're gonna get some pretty interesting results at the end of it, I promise, all right? So, Let's do this. What's the probability of yi given our mu and sigma? Well, that's just a normal distribution again, right? So we still have, I'll write it up here again, p of mu comma phi given our y's should be proportional to, let's write this out. We got a product from i equals 1 to n 
Oh, then let me double check that you guys can actually see this. Uh, yeah, you guys can make that out, I'm sure. Uh, times the product of one over, uh, uh, normally it would be sigma two pi, uh, sigma root two pi, but because we're dealing with phi here, uh, sigma would be square root of phi. So we'll put it all inside the square root of two pi phi. Right, because remember, we're using phi the variance here. And then e to the minus one over two phi, once again, instead of sigma squared, times yi minus mu. Where, uh, did I, am I using mu? Yeah, I'm using mu. Okay, squared. Make sure I wasn't using theta, because I oftentimes use theta instead of mu, but this is fine. All right, so we have all that. And we still got to multiply by our prior of mu comma phi. Now, what we're going to do for the prior, and I'm not going to actually explain why this is, but historic for, for essentially the canonical re, uh, thing that people use, kind of for like historical reason, has to do with what's called Fisher priors. Uh, this ends up being p of mu comma phi is proportional to just phi to the negative one. Don't ask. I'm not going to give a full explanation of it. You, uh, I can if you really want. Sometime in the future, you're welcome to ask me. Uh, it's a bit of a pain to explain, but just trust me, this is what we use. Now, in practice, I'm going to say right now, in practice, when you're actually doing Bayesian inference in modern day, you do not use this. You just use something like a, like you assume that the, that the standard deviation might be like a half Cauchy or a, or a half normal or an exponential or things like that. You actually use fairly normal distribution, like common distributions. This is actually kind of a weird one that is actually only used because of, uh, of a few reasons. One of them being that you can actually analytically solve everything when you have it. All right. So once we say that this is just phi to the negative one, uh, we'll use that in the future. OK, so here, first of all, we have this product of all this. Um, we can say that this is just the product of all these times the product of all these, right? And the product of these, they're all the same for all the n's because these are all just constants. And then also, just real fast, uh, this one over root two pi, that can go away because we're doing the constant thing here. So that all disappears. Phi, though, we can't disappear because that is one of our variables, right? So we can't get rid of that, right? So what we have is n, one over square root of uh, phi is there. So what this ends up being is you get uh, one over square root of phi to the n, which we'll simplify with, you know, in just a moment as an exponent. And then we still have this phi here. Uh, and then we and this, this product here, product from i equals one to n of e to the minus one over two phi, y i minus mu squared, and then we just have times our prior, which is just phi to the minus one. So now we can move these two together. This guy is just phi to the minus n over two. And then we minus one off of those. So therefore we get, I believe, if my math is right, you can check. I believe this thing ends up becoming uh, phi to the minus n plus one over two. That combines these two together. And now if we have a product of exponentials, right? We already have gone through this a little bit. This just becomes e to the minus one over two phi times the sum for i equals one to n, because once again, when you have multiplying exponents and you know, exponentials, you are adding the exponents, right? Of y i minus mu squared, all right? So there. That's a lot simpler already. Now, let's do a quick little detour here and reduce this uh, summation here. All right. So for a moment here, I just want to focus on this guy right here. All right. And then we'll come back and plug it back in once we've evalu evaluated it. So the sum from i equals 1 to n of yi minus mu squared. Well, remember, mu is the true mean the underlying mean of the of the population of Chapman males. 
height. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to define y bar is 1 over n times the sum of from i equals 1 to n of yi, right? This is just the average of the sample. We're going to define that, all right? And then what we're going to say is that this guy right here is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of yi minus y bar plus y bar minus mean squared. This is a classic trick whenever you're dealing with this sort of thing, right, where you subtract y bar and add y bar, and then we can just put in these parentheses thanks to the associative property. And now we have to expand this out, all right? Actually, uh, just for my sake, I'm going to move this over here just so we have space. So we have that y bar. We're going to be using this for the rest of the problem. Y bar is sum from y equals 1 to n of yi. All right. So now that we have this, we can expand it out. So this is the sum from i equals 1 to n of yi minus y bar squared plus 2 times yi minus y bar, y bar minus mu, plus y bar mi minus mu squared, All right? All inside this summation. But now, since these are all additions, we can put the sum, this plus this plus this summed over it is equal to the sum of this plus the sum of this plus the sum of this. Right, we can distribute out that summation. This is going to be a sum from y equals 1 to n of this guy, which is yi minus y bar squared, which that should look kind of familiar. That should look kind of like the standard deviation in the sample of the sample. And then right here, we have the sum of from i equals 1 to n of 2 yi minus y bar times y bar minus mu. And then finally, you get plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of y bar minus mu squared. Now, first thing's important here. We're summing up over all the i's here. Right? You'll notice, first of all, there's no i's in this. Right? This is the average of the sample. And this is the mu, which is our true underlying mean. And so when you sum up n of these, they're all the same value. You just get the same value n times. So this is very simple. This just becomes n times that. Similarly, because we have this product here, I, you know, uh, right here, this the guy does involve i, so we can't just you know change this into n times whatever. But we can pull this guy out in front, right? So this guy, as you can see, will be uh, two y bar minus mu times the sum from i equals one to n of yi minus y bar. Now, hopefully you already know what this is, right? If we take the sum of all the differences from the mean, that should be zero, right? If we wanted to, we could do it right there. It's actually easy enough to actually prove this, right? Based on this definition, we can split this up, right? So it should be sum from i equals one to n of yi minus, the sum from y, i equals 1 to n of y bar. y bar is a number, so you sum it up n times and you get n times y bar, right? So now this is n y bar. And y bar is defined right here as 1 over n times that. So if you plug this in, then the 1 over n, the n cancels out. Now you have the sum of y i minus the sum of y i. That's going to be 0. So just like we expect, right? So this whole term ends up going to 0 because this sum is 0. This thing times zero is still zero. And so now we have sum from i equals one to n of yi minus y bar squared plus n times y bar minus mu squared. All right. Now we're going to do one last substitution here. I'm on my second page of notes. Oh boy. Yeah, I'm only on the. Uh, oh no, I'm actually on the third page. That's the good news. Huh, okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to do our second substitution here. Don't worry, if it makes you feel better, we're on page three of four in the notes here. 
All right, but don't worry, the worst is yet to come. So uh, we can t so take solace in that fact. So now we're going to do this nice, lovely little substitution here. I equals 1 to n, very strategic here, of yi minus y bar squared. Let me make sure you can actually see this on the board. Yeah, you can. All right, so this is the second one. This is our sample error, sample standard deviation. All right, so our standard error because we have the n minus 1 there. Um, and so now when we look at this, obviously we can't find exactly in there, but this term right here is just this times n minus 1. And so let me just make sure you can actually see that other side too, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Just really, you can't actually see the 1 I have in a circle here. Sorry, so let me uh, add a little note here so that way I know what you can see and what you can't. So here, let me quickly move this. I was going to say 1 is right there, right? Hopefully now you can see that. So here, this thing is going to become n minus 1 times s squared plus n times y bar minus mu squared. All right? Phew. Now let's put it back into here and keep going. Uh, I could, I'm just going to erase it. Like I said, you guys can copy things down if you need to because you have YouTube. How lucky you guys are. Okay. So now we're here. But then you got on my side, I don't have to worry about, you know, actually letting you guys out on time. This lecture could be going for two hours and 45 minutes. I don't know. How long has it gone on for so far? Wow, we're already at the hour mark and we still got a lot more to do. This is probably going to be a good two hours. We'll see. All right. So here, this reduces down to phi minus n minus n plus 1 over 2. I believe this is as far as we're going to go for right now. And then we got a second problem we got to deal with. But uh, we'll stop here for just a moment and actually graph some of this stuff and take a look at it. So we got that guy, e to the minus 1 over 2 phi. And then we have in here, this is reduced down to n minus 1 s squared plus n times y bar minus mu squared. All right, and there we go. And that right there is proportional to, once again, our distribution for phi and mu, given our data. All right, now one thing you'll notice that's kind of cool here is that rather than having all the yi's, We've reduced it down to these two numbers that summarize all the important date information from the data, right? To figure out the posterior for our mu and phi, all we need to know is the average value from the sample and the standard error from the sample. And as long as we have those two values, that's all the summary we need. All the other details about the numbers don't matter. All right? Given our model, given our assumptions in our model of independence and normal distribution, right? There was a lot of assumptions in there in our prior. Uh, then this is all true. Under other models, it might not be true. If we had other models, such as with the correlations between family members, suddenly the specifics of some of the values might actually matter, and you can't just use the mean and the standard deviation and such. All right. So here we go. Let's take a look at this real fast to see what this looks like. Because what this is, this is a joint posterior. So what it is that we have some, rather than like on the other ones where we just had our theta, for example, and what's the distribution of theta? How sure are we of the different values of theta? Now we have a mu and a phi together, and they have some 2D distribution. All right? And what we'll see is what it looks like. It kind of looks almost like an egg when you draw the contours. Looks something like this. Right, but let's quickly plot it. I have the plot on the computer already ready to go. So let's take a look at that. So here, yeah, shut up. Here we go. So what I did was I plugged it in. I have the phi to the, what is it, minus n plus 1 over 2. So clearly I set my n to be 5 here. Oh, yeah, right here. You can see it right here. And then e to the minus 1 over 2 phi um, times... Uh, and then here I set my standard, uh, that one, uh, n minus 1 s squared. I just set uh, s squared to be uh, 
one here. Let me do this properly. I'm sorry. I uh, I was messing around with some stuff. With n minus one, if n is five, because I said we have five data points, so n minus one is four, and then plus five times y minus mu. And here I assumed our y was zero. So what I assumed was that we sampled five people, and it turned out that their mean was one, and the average standard devi and the standard deviation of the I mean, sorry the mean was zero, and the standard deviation of the population were one. So I just kind of centered it all and normalized it all. And standardize it all just so that way the numbers work out really nicely that's all if we want to we could actually put in a true mean right here so it could be like oh yeah the mean of the sample was six foot five right so it'd be six minus mu and the variance we observed was whatever the variance was and we could have included that but i set the variance to one and i set the mean to uh zero here but here just for effect i'll make it be uh let's make it be um what like 70 inches which is uh in inches that would be about uh, five foot ten. So we can do that if we really want, right? And then it would be, I just have to change my bounds for plotting when I do that. All right. So if we do that, let's take a look at this. This is just all using Wolfram Alpha. Oh, wait up. I think I need to run it one more time. Right? Let's take a look at this. Hopefully this works. Yeah, here it goes. So when we do this, we have our this is what the contour, the distribution looks like. We can also try doing instead of a, a contour plot, you can actually look at the actual plot of it. You might find this interesting as well. It doesn't look, you know, it looks like this, where our best guess is right here and it kind of trails off. It's not quite normal. You can see it's definitely not normal right? because if it was normal, it would be all symmetric, but it definitely kind of skews out towards larger values in that direction. All right, so let me go back to the contour plot where it's easier to explain. Contour plot, there we go. What we're seeing here is that this, this right here is our mean estimate. So our best guess as to the mean is still 70, as you'd expect. Uh, but we aren't quite sure about the, sig, uh, about the, the variance here, where the variance could be uh, quite large, right? It could be small. But it could be quite large, and the reason why we aren't quite sure about it is because obviously we don't we're basing it off the data, and you know we don't have a perfect uh, information from the data. But also uh, the reason why it's skewed towards larger values is because you can imagine if the standard deviation was really low, um, then the probability that some of this data, you know, suppose that you know here, let me show you on the board, and it might make some sense. You know, imagine we got data that looked like this, right? Like here's some data points, right? Maybe I'll use dots here just for the sake of argument, right? So we got like some data over here. We got maybe one right out here, right? Right, so we got some data. Uh, if it turned out that the standard deviation was really low, we would expect the data to be distributed like around here, right? With very low standard deviation and this data would be like huge outliers that are really kill you, right? And say that this, this is just it's not going to be this low, right? Meanwhile, if we have like a reasonable value, like, oh, yeah, you know, that seems to explain the data pretty well. But if we said the standard deviation was really high, like, yeah, okay, each one of these has a lower probability, but it's not like, you know, but it still explains the data okay. We just didn't see any of these super extreme ones. And so part of it is that, is that, yeah, when you err on the side of having too large of a standard deviation, it doesn't hurt your likelihood nearly as much as if you have too tight of a distribution. And so because of that, there's this asymmetry where higher ones are okay. A second reason for it is just that we're bound. We can't have standard deviation or variance below zero, right? You can't have negative. And so because of that, you're also bound on this side. And so because of that, it ends up being skewed more in favor of higher values, which is kind of interesting. All right. But anyway, we have this nice little joint distribution. And what on earth do we do with it? Uh, there isn't much that we can really do with it, it turns out. I mean, there are. There is. There is. But, um, but by itself, this isn't really what we want. Because we're going to ask the question like, OK, what's the probability that the true mean is above 72 inches, above 6 feet? Uh, what do we do to do that, right? Well, what we'll have to do is we'll have to take 72 here. And we'll have to integrate this whole region, 
everything higher than 72. Any place with a mean is higher than 72, we have to figure out what's the probability in here. And first, before I forget, we'll also have to first integrate this whole thing and then normalize it, right? Because otherwise we can't interpret anything because we integrate this and it comes out to be like 800. And it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything, right? Because first we have to normalize it. So that way everything is summed up to one when we integrate the whole thing. And then we have to integrate from the right of this. And then that'll give us the actual probability. And in general, what's interesting is that we don't really care what phi is, do we? We don't really care all that much. What we care about is mu. And so what we frequently want to do is to actually get useful information to get the distribution we really want, which is the marginal distribution of mu. We have to get rid of the phi. And to do that, we just have to integrate it out. So what we're going to have to do, uh, this phi is oftentimes called a nuisance parameter because it's something that, yeah, it's a parameter that we need to solve for, but we aren't actually interested in it when we're actually trying to draw conclusions. Maybe you are, but in our case, typically we're not. We're asking all of our hypotheses were about the average height of, of males at Chapman. So we got to actually deal with that. All right, so what we're going to have to do is to get the probability of just mu given our data, what we're going to have to do is that that should be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of p of mu comma phi, the joint distribution, joint posterior, d phi. We have to integrate out the phi, integrate over all the phi's to get our mu. Right, our distribution, our marginal distribution of mu. So that's going to be the last step of this. We got to do this integral. And it's not pleasant. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not a pleasant integral to do at all. All right. Um, and this is where a lot of times we end up having problems because when we have these massive joint distributions, we can't really easily draw any conclusions or anything useful without doing integrating down to only the parameter we're actually interested in. And lots of times, integrals, as you know, just aren't analytic, don't ha aren't anal analytically tractable, right? You're going to have to do them on computers or something like that. And when we get to, we aren't going to do it in this class, but lots of times with Bayesian inference, you end up having, you end up having like hundreds or thousands of parameters. I mean, yeah, you have a lot of parameters. And so what are you going to do? Do like, a, like 500 integrals? Like get real, right? So we end up having to fall back to other methods. And this is actually one of the main points for number two, which I'll finish, which I'll actually finish and do this integral in just a moment. But there's there's a couple points to doing the second problem. One is that uh, the that Bayesian you can't do it analytically, right? That essentially math is hard, right? To impossible somewhere somewhere between hard and impossible. We can only actually do this for simple values, and that's why we had to use this simple. A uh, little prior here because that's what's analytically tractable. So let's plug this in. So this is proportional to the integral from zero to infinity of this whole thing. And just for the sake of doing this, I'm just going to right now do a substitution, which is a is equal to n minus one s squared plus n times y bar minus mu squared. Right. I'm just going to take this whole thing and just say a here, just so that way it doesn't take up half the board. So we get phi, and also importantly, none of these involve phi, right? They're all just a function of the data here. And then so right here, uh, since we're integrating over phi, it's just like a constant that can come out of the A, which we'll see in a moment. So we have phi to the minus n plus 1 over 2, e to the minus a over 2 phi d phi, right? And this is proportional to. No, I actually, I, I left my math over here. Because this is where the math starts getting quite hairy. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a U substitution, right? You guys all remember your U substitutions, hopefully. And the substitution is going to be Z is equal to A over 2 phi. Don't forget that uh, given this, by the way, when phi is infinity, then uh, this z is zero, and when it's zero, this z is infinity. So it's still the limits are still going to be zero to infinity, just reverse. So you have to do like negative or something like that. 
Uh, don't forget, you got to also do what is dz is equal to, of course, the derivative of this, which is minus a over 2 phi squared, right? Uh, d phi. So therefore, you're going to have to move that around. You got to plug everything. So therefore, you're going to get a, a phi squared in there and everything. And you got to do this whole substitution. I'm not going to bother doing it right now. You know, you know formally, I'm just going to tell you the answer. This thing comes up to be proportional to a to the minus uh, n over 2. And by the way, keep in mind, a here, while it's not a function of phi, it is a function of mu. So we can't just say, oh, proportional, get rid of it. It's all constants. It's not. There's mu right there. That's our function, right? So we still have a to the minus n over 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of z to the n minus 2 over 2 e to the minus z dz. So I'm sure you all immediately know this integral. It is an unnormalized gamma integral, gamma function. Didn't you know that? Of course. I actually did at one point know this because in one of my math classes, we did Laplace transforms and stuff, and I'm pretty sure it comes up during all that. But um, anyway, at the end of the day, this thing just evaluates to a number, right? And luckily, that thing all goes, you know, so we have the portion here. It turns out, since there's no, uh, once we've done this uh, use substitution and stuff, we've gotten the mu out of there. So now we have this mu in front and we have this big constant, which like I said, ends up being kind of like a factorial is what it ends up being. You can get the factorial by doing uh, substitutions over and over, uh, was integration by uh, by parts over and over. I think you'll, you'll get out like an n minus two over two, n minus one over two times n minus, times n over two times, uh, sorry, n minus two over two times n minus three over two times n minus four over two, blah, blah, blah right, all the way down to zero, and you multiply them all together, and so you end up with like a factorial. But anyway, this whole thing ends up going into the memory hole. Whoop. This unnormalized gamma. And what we're left with is this bad boy. And so once we plug A back in there, this guy is just going to be equal to n minus 1, s squared, plus n times mu minus y bar squared. I think I just swapped the uh, the y bar and the mu, whatever. It doesn't matter because it's the squared. Once again, you can do the order either way. All to the minus n over 2. We're almost done. We're on to the last line. What we do is we can factor out a, uh, a n minus 1 s squared out front. And since that thing doesn't involve mu, it'll all go down the memory hole. Right, so now we just have one plus n times mu minus y squared divided by n minus one s squared all to the minus n over two. I'm gonna erase a little bit and put this in a box because this is the actual final result that we really care about here. I'm going to erase some of this little math that we did to get here and just write down the result. Because this is a big one. This is a big one. You might not believe it, right? How many of you recognize this function? Probably nobody. But it is an important function here. All right, I'm going to actually rewrite it up above just for completeness here. P of mu given y bar is proportional to we have to actually, you know, technically there's still the normalization business we got to deal with. N times mu minus y bar squared divided by N minus 1 S squared to the minus N over 2. Phew. So this is our distribution for the mean, given our data. Going on to 1 hour and 15 minutes already. Let's take a look at it. Really fast here. 
what we often do, just to make things a little bit even, a little bit simpler, we're going to do one last substitution in here. Keep in mind, we already did our substitution with the Y bar and the S. But lots of times what people end up doing is they figure out, they, they, they term everything in terms of how many standard deviations away are you. And so to do that, of course, what you take is the, you do a substitution where you say what T is equal to, all right? Where you say T here is equal to, um, I need to make sure I have this right. I believe what you do is you take mu minus Y divided by S, uh, over root of n is equal to n is equal to t. We do the substitution, so you'll see that this squared will give us s squared, and then you have root of n here, right? And so the root of n squared is the n, so there would be an over n here, which is right here. And you have mu minus y bar, and then when you square it, there's squared. So this ends up becoming equal to you know this right here, p of mu comma y time mu given y is proportional to, in this case, you get 1 plus t squared all over n minus 1 all to the minus n over 2. And I guess t should give you a clue here. This right here is an unnormalized t distribution. This is the t distribution. Right here, here's the formula for it. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. Maybe you have, maybe you have, probably haven't. I almost, I never see it in any real textbook, but this is the actual formula for the t-distribution. And we'll get a little bit of an intuition for exactly what it means in just a moment, all right? Surprise, it's a t-distribution. So let's plot it. So let's suppose that we have, with, by the way, this is with n minus one degrees of freedom, all right? T distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So let's suppose that we have four data points. So what we're going to plot is one plus t squared over four, all to the power of minus, uh, if we have five data points, so n minus one is four, and we take to the power of five ha minus five halves. And we're going to plot that from t equals minus five to five. And sure enough, you look at it, and it looks pretty much like a normal distribution. It has a little bit fatter tails. What happens if we have it, uh, and now keep in mind, this is how many standard deviations away it is. Let's knock down uh, the number of data points. So that way we only have three. Does it look about the same? Let's see. Uh, it looks about the same. Let's knock it down to two data points. Now this is pretty extreme. It's very extreme right here. All right, you start seeing that it has these really fat tails by then. All right. Now what's this actually doing? What's this T distribution? How do we interpret it? So keep in mind, let's look back at this contour plot and try to understand what it's saying. All right, so what is this T distribution saying? Sorry, this is another jump because I had accidentally uh, given 10 more minutes of lecture and then I uh, realized I hadn't changed my camera back to the whiteboard and it was all on the computer. So let me quickly finish this off. And then I'll have to stop here for a little bit because my earbuds are almost dead. So let's interpret this. So we saw the contour and let me draw it again. Right, it was this egg shape. And this is our phi, and this is our mu. And what's interesting about this is that when we look at it intuitively, we're like, okay, before when we were doing that, uh, the two normals with the GPS and everything, we add them together and we got a normal posterior. And here we have a bunch of normally distributed data because we said that the heights of people are normally distributed. That was our base assumption. That's how we got the likelihood. And even though we had a slightly weird prior, it wasn't anything, it was mostly nothing. It was just, it just changed the exponent a little bit in the phi. So the question becomes, well, why is it that we have all this normal data, we put it all together, and we end up with a posterior for mu that is not normal. It's a T distribution. That's a weird thing. And, you know, in classes, when I was first learning statistics, it's always just like, okay, you have some data. Look it up in a t. Look up your your in a t table what the test statistic is. 
right? That was always what it was. And it was always, why are we looking up in a T distribution? Like, what the heck is this thing? And we get this equation, and sure enough, the math backs up that when we have normally distributed data, our distribution for the mu is a T distribution. And it makes us wonder, what is this thing exactly? Well, let's take a look. So it turns out that if we were to look at just one little strip in here, right? Let's say this one. Let's say that we know our phi exactly. And now we look at the different mu's. If you were to graph this, this distribution, it actually would be a normal distribution, perfectly normal, right? And so if you knew the phi was exactly this, then the distribution for mu would be normal, which fits in line with our, with our intuition. However, it's not just this, right? It could be this, but it could also be this down here. And this corresponds, is still centered on y bar, but now this is a much more narrow one, right? Where the variance is very small. And so what this would look like is more like this. This is also possible for the distribution of mu if the phi ends up being small. It's also possible that the phi is actually really large. And then what we'd have is a distribution that looks like this. We don't know which it is because we, don't, we only have a few data points or n data points. So the best we can do is make a guess or have some, we have a lot of uncertainty still on what, our, what the variance actually is in our posterior, because we don't know what the actual variance is for our estimate of the mean. It could be anything. It could be a really tight distribution for the distribution of the mean, or it could be a really wide one. And so what we're doing is to actually get the marginal distribution. Keep in mind what we had to do was P of mu given Y, we said was proportional to the integral or was equal to the integral of p of mu comma phi given y bar and y y uh y vector d phi and so what we're doing is we're going to take each one of these slices and sum them all up because specifically when we take this what we can write this as if we want to write it a little bit clearer using our definition of conditional probability, this right here should be equal to the probability of mu given the phi and the y bar times the probability of, yeah, there we go, times probability of phi given y bar d phi, right? We just split this up into two pieces, right? So this is, what's the probability of mu given some phi right here this is one of them right or it could be this one where if the phi is really small this is the distribution for mu or if the phi is really large this is the distribution and then we have to say well how likely is it that it's actually this really small phi or what's the probability that's actually this really large phi and so then we have to take each one of these little normal distributions, each one of these sub -dist normal distributions, and you have to weight them by how likely they actually are. And then we have to sum it up over all the different phi's possible. So what we're doing is, according to this, the T distribution is just the summing up of all these other distributions, weighting them according to how likely these variances actually are. And so what ends up happening is we end up with, here's a normal distribution, let's say. The, uh, what we end up with is that the T distribution, first of all, tends to be a little bit narrower on top. Why? Because it has some of these really narrow distributions are quite possible, right? And then secondly, it tends to have fatter tails than the normal distribution because well, it's possible that uh, it has that it's a normal distribution with really uh, high variance, right? Because the high variance is possible and also the really narrow ones are possible. You end up with a distribution that looks normal, right? From afar, if you're not looking too carefully, it looks fairly normal, but 
it tends to be a little bit peakier at the top and a little bit fatter tails on the far ends. All right. And it's purely because it's a mixture of these different normal distributions. You're just piling them all, adding them all up and getting the sum of them. All right. Weighting them appropriately. So that's what the T distribution is. And that's why when we don't have an infinite amount of data and we have to guess at the standard deviation, the underlying standard deviation, it ends up, once we pile them all up, we don't get a normal. We get a T distribution. Now, one last note here, and then I'll call this a uh, partial day here. Um, we expect that as we go off to an infinite uh, number of data points, we'll know the standard deviation exactly. And when we do, we should be able to get this, this should be a normal distribution because now there's no uncertainty as to what the variance is. We know it exactly once we have an infinite amount of data. So we expect that T distribution to approach a normal distribution, right? So we say the limit as N goes to infinity of one plus T squared over N minus one to the minus N over two. And we expect that when we take the limit as this goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, this should give us a normal distribution. To confirm this, maybe you already can take this limit. A lot of people don't know it. Uh, but it's not too bad because you probably, in calculus one, at some point, somebody threw this in front of you. T1 plus r over n to the nt. This is compound interest. And the limit of this, as, a, as you compound continuously, is e to the rt. So here, what we can see is that, first of all, the n and the n minus 1 isn't going to make a difference when we go off to infinity, clearly. right? But r is t squared, so we have e to the t squared right there. And then here, uh, the n is there, but we still have a minus 1 half. So we have to, instead of t, as minus 1 half. So we have t squared times minus 1 half, which is equal to e to the t squared over minus t squared over two. And this right here is indeed the equation for a unnormalized standard normal, right? We never actually have normalized yet, right? So this is a standard normal though, right? Because this is equivalent to e to the minus one over two times one squared times uh, uh, zero minus t squared or t minus zero squared. Uh, I'll do t minus zero. And so what you'll see is that this means that the mean is zero, standard deviation is one, but it is just the exact same as normal distribution. So there we have it. We're done. Uh, we've proven that the long, in the long run with enough data, it becomes normal. We've seen why the t-distribution does it. And the whole point of this exercise was one, that way you would actually understand where the t-distribution comes from for a change, t-distribution. And secondly, to see, that this math is a real pain, a real pain, right? To do all this. And you and we had to rely on actually being able to do this integral. We got lucky and we were able to do it. Lots of times when we have to take hundreds of integrals, there's just no chance of it. And we have to come up with some other way to do it. And so that's something we'll talk about soon. All right, uh, I'll finish up the lecture. There's, there'll be a continuing one where we do derivation three and four. I promise you, two was the worst right here. So you made it through the worst, you can take a short break. I know I am, and then we're going to come back and finish the last two derivations. All right, see you then.